Hello, it's David from David Savory Electrical Services and in this video today I will be looking at some of the changes between British Standard 7671 17th Edition Amendment 3 from 2015 and the new 18th edition which came out a week ago at the beginning of July 2018. Now I'm not going to cover all the changes introduced by 18th edition but I am going to list those that are interesting to me and will affect my day-to-day -day working life as a mainly domestic electrician. As such, this video will be of interest to other jobbing electricians, but maybe less so to those who specialise in certain technologies rather than the run-of-the-mill domestic spark buggery. As I mentioned in a previous video about passing the 17th or 18th edition exam, I like to flick through a new regs book and highlight stuff of interest. This keeps me familiarised with what's where and what's new, and helps me to find information quickly, which is handy when looking things up, but is also a good aid when it comes to taking the exam. And indeed, mine is booked in August, so I have a month to get to know what's whizzy in the wonderful world of wiring. When I go through the book with my highlighter, I do so with reference to my previous book, as that also helps me to identify what I found interesting last time and what has moved around. And it's from this exercise that I have compiled this list today out in the 30 degree sunshine as I am and armed with a Pims and lemonade because I like to think I'm man enough to get away with the odd jug of lady piss on a hot day but I'm going off topic so without further ado let's have a look at some of the movers and shakers in BS 7671 18th edition and we shall start at part 2 where there are various changes in the definitions one of the more obvious ones being the term discrimination which basically meant that the further downstream you went on a circuit then the lower the value of the localised protective devices but discrimination probably sounds racist or something, so in an act of discrimination against it, the more happy-sounding selectivity has now been given the job. To be fair, the term selectivity has been in the definitions list for some time. It's certainly in the Green Book of 17th edition, incorporating Amendment Number 1 from 2011. But in previous books, it simply referred you to discrimination. Now discrimination is no more, and the definition for discrimination has been encompassed entirely under selectivity. There are no changes in part 3, so we'll skip to part 4, protection for safety. And we have an exciting change to regulation 411.3.1.2. Metallic pipes having an insulating section at their point of entry need not be connected to the protective equipotential bonding. At last, good riddance to water bonding, at least on those installations where the incoming service is plastic. Regulation 411.3.3 .3 has also changed, and in a dwelling, all socket outlets must now be RCD protected, with no exceptions, unlike before where a label could be used to indicate a given outlet was not RCD protected and was for a specific item of equipment only. Now, Personally, I'd prefer to still have the label exception, as I used it for installing sockets for a Freeview aerial boosters located in the attic. As the booster was always a class 2 device supplied with a plug and as the new outlet was off this lighting circuit which wasn't RCD protected on older installations, this was a useful way to keep costs down. Now I either have to cut off the plug and install it on a few spur which may invalidate the warranty and make the job take longer, or I need to install an RCD socket in a position accessible enough that its test button can be operated as per manufacturer's instructions. Hey ho! Exceptions are still permitted for non-dwelling installations, but a documented risk assessment must be produced between the site duty holder and the appointed electrician. Regulation 411.3.2.2 previously stated the maximum disconnection times for TN installations of up to 230 volts AC was 0.4 seconds for any circuit up to 32 amps and 5 seconds for higher rated distribution circuits. However, that has changed slightly with 0.4 seconds now applying on circuits up to 63 amps with one or more socket outlets and still 32 amps when supplying only fixed connected current using equipment. 5 seconds still applies to distribution circuits or circuits not covered by this regulation. Another change is regulation 411.3.4 which now requires AC circuits supplying luminaires to be RCD protected. No real surprise that one, the use of RCDs has crept forward over previous amendments and by 17th edition amendment 3 we were already obliged to RCD protect cables buried in walls at less than 50mm and cables or accessories serving or passing through a room with a bath or a shower, so new or altered lighting circuits may well have been RCD protected anyway to keep on side of amendment 3, but now there's a specific regulation requiring it. Part 4 is where we start seeing some numbering changes, which is always a bit of a pain in the arse. As an example, regulation 411.4.4 in the big yellow book is now regulation 411.4.5 in the big blue book. And strangely, 411.4.4 in big blue book was 411.4.5 in the big yellow book. So these regs seem to have swapped their numbers. I don't know why this needs to happen, but there are many numbering changes in parts 4, 5 and 6. So when you're going back to refer to a reg you know or have seen discussed in notes, publications or on the internet, 
you may now find that reg is under a completely different number and an imposter is in its place. Incidentally, a line mark to the right of any sentence or paragraph indicates a change since the last publication, so you get an idea of what's different. This change may just be to correct a typo or a gra grammatical error, otherwise it may denote a change of wording, a whole new sentence or paragraph, or a relocation of a regulation. Now on to protection against thermal effects and regulation 421.1.7. This being the use of arc fault detection devices, or AFDDs, also known as arc fault circuit interrupters, or AFCIs, to our American cousins, where I understand they have been in use for some time. 18th edition slips these in as a recommendation, i.e. use them if you want, and the expectation is that once they become more established, then future revisions will start making them mandatory. What are AFDDs and why should you care? Well, an arc fault detection device is a clever bit of electronics that can detect an arc between conductors or on a series line and cut the power before the thermal damage causes a fire. The electronics can detect different arc signatures, so a natural arc briefly formed when a mechanical switch is thrown won't trip the device, in theory, but an arc across a loose connection or between cores on a damaged cable will actuate it. We've all seen burnt out shower isolators where the 6 or 10mm cable has worked loose in the isolator and burnt out the connections, and this is the kind of fault an AFDD will supposedly prevent. At the time of recording this video, I see four problems with this technology, however. Number one, they're currently very expensive, but expect prices to drop with economies of scale. Number two, they're impossible to get hold of. I've been trying to get my hands on a Schneider or Eaton model, but despite these companies telling me their wares are out there, none of my usual resellers seem willing or able to get me one of the damn things. Hopefully, I can obtain one in the coming weeks to show you all here. Number three, they're huge. We know an MCB or RCBO takes up one fuseway, but an AFDD with RCD and MCB protection will take up three fuseways. Yes, you heard that right. Three fuseways for one circuit. They'll probably shrink down in time, but retrofit applications are simply not going to happen, and consumer units of the future are going to be behemoths. Uh, number four, the day the regs require the use of these things in retrofit applications is the day I either retire or at least pull consumer unit replacements from my proffered services. At present, a house may pass a test and inspect as part of a new CU change, but even then I cannot absolutely guarantee that any given abode is completely free from loose connections. If I install an AFDD board onto older wiring and it keeps tripping off because of some little loose connection within a junction box under the floor that's been there for 25 years and that I don't know about, well, what chance have I got? It's fine on new builds where you know the circuit routes and where hidden junctions are unlikely, but older properties could be a nightmare. Even on new builds, there needs to be a way to tell if a device like this has tripped off because of an overload, earth fault, or arc fault. If you just turn up and find it tripped, then the fault finding and rectification aspect could be a real ball ache. I'm not convinced, but the Yanks, the Aussies and the Germans use them, so there must be something in it. I may know more if I can actually get hold of one to review it, so do click subscribe and watch this space. Now a small correction for you on page 96 of the blue book, as there is an error. This error was printed on page 91 of the yellow book, and a corrigendum was issued in January 2016 to correct it, along with a few other errors. However, it seems to have slipped through to the blue book. Page 96, section 442, should read protection of low voltage installations against temporary over voltages due to earth faults in the high voltage system and due to faults in the voltage system. It should not say low voltage. It's nice to know they're on the ball with this publication. There is a lot of new stuff on the remaining pages of this part, most of which is concerned with lightning strikes and surge protected devices. I must admit that at the time of recording this I haven't really digested this information and it probably doesn't impact me too much as a domestic electrician in the middle of England. Certainly SPDs are creeping in and have been for a while now, but they remain arguably too expensive for most domestic jobs, unless perhaps you're at a higher risk of a lightning strike or other surge event. I'll have to admit my ignorance on this one and perhaps revisit the topic when I've had further exposure to it. Where the big yellow book ends at part 4, in the big blue book there is a whole new chapter, chapter 46, which covers isolation and switching and contains some information that was previously included in part 5 under selection and direction. Again, this is where you'll find a lot of the same regulations as before, but now under wholly new numbers and in a different part of the book. So if you're undertaking the 18th edition exam, then you'll need to be aware of what's been moved around since the 17th. This means there are now two isolation and switching sections, one in part 4 under chapter 46, and one in part 5 under chapter 53. Here's something I noticed in the new chapter 46, or rather I didn't notice it because it was missing. In the yellow book, as part of regulation 537.1.3, it was stated that a cutout fuse may be withdrawn only by a person authorised to do so by the distributor. 
but the new equivalent regulation, Reg 462.1, omits this sentence, and I haven't noticed it anywhere else in the blue book. Now, the question of Spark is pulling supplier fuses has always been controversial. The district network operators don't allow it, although their engineers on the ground often turn a blind eye. And the CPS schemes also frown upon it, even though the likes of NAPIT have been campaigning to bring such permission in. It's interesting to me that the 17th edition specifically disallowed it, but that it seems to have been removed from 18th edition. That does not mean you're clear to pull the fuse as, as a jobbing Sparky, but I do wonder why it has been removed. Let's move on to part five, selection and direction, and look at the notices. These are the stickers we have to slap on or around the consuming unit or distribution board, and little has changed here except the bloody font size, which has been embiggened. And yes, the regs do state that the font should be no smaller than what is reproduced here. I have several issues with the notices, not least their huge size, which can make their placement difficult in domestic installations, and which can turn an already fugly Amendment 3 consumer unit into something even worse looking. Most stock labels, label printers and label sheets supplied by the manufacturers will fail to meet this font size, and I understand that it needs to be legible for those with poor eyesight, but it's not something the homeowner needs to read every day, and if your electrical contractor hasn't got good enough eyesight to be able to read a smaller label, then they really shouldn't be getting elbows deep into your distribution board. I see we still have the intelligence insulting two colours label, unfortunately. I mean, why, for goodness sake? If I'm on an installation, then I can see what wiring colours are in use. I don't need a heads up. And if you don't know how to interpret the colours before you and how to verify that those colours are correctly indicating the function of the conductors, well, then you shouldn't be pissing around with the electrics. I understand that this is more for three phase, where in the old world, blue was a line conductor, while in post-2005 colours, it's a neutral... But again, if you don't know what you're looking at, then why are you fucking about with three phase? The two colours label should pack up and piss off. The inspection and testing label is as useless as ever. Last and next inspection dates on their own are meaningless. Besides the dates, this label should contain the name and contact details of whomever performed the work, their CPS registration number if they have one, and their certificate or report reference number, like my custom labels do. This allows an installation owner or appointed Sparky to see who did the work and what it covered. As it stands, the stock sticker may indicate a full or partial inspection, relate to a single circuit or the whole board, and the inspection, for what it was worth, may have been performed by goodness knows who and with goodness knows what level of competency. It's a simple improvement that gets overlooked with every new addition and amendment. Anyway, the short story is that the notice labels are shit, and I won't be complying with their font size requirements. I'm sorry, but they're just not practical. I will apply the required labelling where needed, but they'll be smaller, and in the case of the inspection and testing label, actually fit for purpose. There you go. Continuing on with part five, wiring in escape routes was something Amendment 3 brought in under Regulation 521.11, and required that wiring mounted in such locations would not be subject to premature collapse in the event of a fire. This meant no more plastic clips holding cables or conduit to walls, and instead the likes of metal saddles and metal trunking inserts were required, so that if the plastic clips or containment melted in a fire, then the cables would hold in place and not hinder the movement of firefighters entering the building. This has now been moved to Regulation 521.10.202, which beefs things up further, and now requires all wiring to be secured from premature collapse. This means any job anywhere in which a length of plastic trunking or conduit or clips may have contained a cable now needs to see that cable secured by metal clips or hooks or whatever so that if the support fails the cable remains in place this doesn't affect cables run within the fabric of the building so a cable running through joists above a plasterboard ceiling doesn't require any new additional support as the plasterboard forms a fire barrier and by the time the ceiling is coming down well then things are collapsing so the point of ensuring against premature collapse will have passed. This may be a bit of a game changer. This regulation means you can't use plastic trunking, conduit or clips pretty much anywhere anymore, at least if I'm reading it right. Think, for example, of twin and earth clipped to a wall with standard grey plastic P-clips. This reg says you can't do that. Think of conduit with plastic saddles. This reg says you can't do that. Think of white plastic trunking, self-adhesive or screwed to the wall. This reg says you can't do that. Think of plastic cable ties holding cables to a structure. This reg says you can't do that. In all these cases, additional metallic support is also required so that if any of these plastic elements fail, then the cables don't fall loose and become a snag risk. This could be a bit of a ball ache as a simple clip job such as wiring that would ordinarily be surface mounted in someone's garage now needs a more robust installation. And of course, as a legitimate installer who is trying to comply with the regulations, except when it comes to label font sizes that is, 
I'm in competition with the non-accredited shitheads and handymen who have no idea that this regulation exists. They won't be signing off any certificate for their work and they can undercut me by keeping the job simple with cheap plastic clips. This is one change which may complicate the life of an honest sparky trying to work by the book. Next, regulation 531.3.1.202 is interesting as it states that it is not permissible to introduce an external connection for the purpose of intentionally creating a residual current to trip an RCD. This does not mean that you can't use your tester to verify RCD times, but it does mean that if you're working on a circuit and you want the RCD off, then it's not acceptable to intentionally join either a live line or a neutral to the earth in order to force it to trip. In the case of the former, you'd be an idiot to do so anyway, and in the latter, well, you'd just be being lazy. But I guess the point is that RCDs, as electromechanical devices, don't last forever. So forcing a fault current through one when there's no need to do so may reduce its life. Regulation 531.3.3 discusses the different types of RCD. That is type AC, A, F and B. Don't confuse these types with types of breaker. A type B MCB is a different affair to a type B RCD. For those of us working domestically, RCDs installed for additional protection conform to type AC. On my electric vehicle charger, I have an RCD to type A installed, the difference being that a type A can detect a pulsating DC component. These RCD types weren't defined in the regulations before, but uh, you're now required to select the right type of RCD for the job, which in most cases will be the AC type unless you're installing equipment which requires otherwise. Let's have a quick chat about dual RCD consumer units which are commonly installed in domestic settings because of cost and ease of availability. In the past, these boards always rubbed against regulation 314 for division of installation, as in the yellow book, Reg 314.2 required the failure of one circuit not to affect any others. And of course, in a dual RCD board, an earth fault on one circuit would mean a trip of the RCD, which would cut the power to the group of circuits that that RCD is protecting. This has, in the past, caused some lively debate on Twitter and other public forums, with some installers insisting that dual RCD boards should be avoided. Think what you will about dual RCD consumer units, but note that in the big blue book, while regulation 314.2 remains unchanged, regulation 531.3.5.2 has now been introduced, and that regulation notes that several circuits may be protected by the same RCD device in a TN system. Those who want to install dual RCD boards now have this regulation to flash at the naysayers wheeled in Reg 314.2. Like it or loathe it, it's in the big blue book, folks. There's not much to say about Part 6, Inspection and Testing, other than it sees some significant numbering changes, seemingly for the sake of it. So instead of starting with Regulation 610 for initial verification, it now starts with Regulation 641, albeit with much the same content. If it's the same content, why move the numbers around? Part 7, Special Locations, sees various changes. But I'm someone who tends not to work in marinas, medical locations, caravan parks, and so on, and domestically speaking, not a lot has changed for your average bathroom. Socket outlets are still not permitted unless they're three metres from zone one. Everything serving or passing through a location with a bath or a shower still requires RCD protection, and the zones haven't changed. I will mention electric vehicle charging, however, as I am myself an EV owner. Under Regulation 722.411.4.1, 17th edition Amendment 3 stated that a PME or TNCS supply couldn't be used as a means for earthing on an EV charger, unless there was no other way around it. This regulation has removed that caveat. For most installations, like mine, this means you'll require an earth rod for the charger with no connection to the main earthing terminal and that there be no metallic parts earthed at the PME on the exterior of the building within reach of the vehicle or its charge point. Now, I really don't understand all the fuss about PME earthing and EV charge points, so someone please enlighten me in the comments. I understand that if the pen conductor fails, then all metallic parts connected at my main earthing terminal may float up at up to 230 volts, which is fine inside the house as it's an equipotential zone, but potentially dangerous when standing outside when you're in direct contact with the earth. Here's the thing though, my EV charge point is fully plastic. My car has its 230 volt input fully isolated from the metal bodywork which is connected to the negative side of the 12 volt accessory battery like any other car. The charger will only produce a supply when connected to the vehicle and when commanded from the vehicle. So it's not like dropping the charge plug into a puddle will make anything go bang. So all that being the case, if my pen conductor fails while the car is on charge, 
it's not going to suddenly float up to 230 volts and become a shock hazard to whoever touches it. Also, the charger will stop working if the neutral path is suddenly lost. I just don't see what the PME problem is. I'm obviously missing some, some point here, but I don't see why PME is so risky for EV charge points and why there is a need for an earth rod, as I can't envisage a situation where my Nissan's bodywork will suddenly be at shock potential. Uh, one other thing about EV charging, if you don't have a dedicated car charger, then you have a plug-in slow charger supplied with the vehicle. Now your average BS1363 plug and socket arrangement is rated for up to 13 amps, but it isn't designed to carry that kind of load current for a significant amount of time. Your kettle might take 13 amps, but only for a minute at a time. However, if you plug in a car charger drawing 10 to 13 amps for several hours, then it can cause problems such as thermal damage. Regulation 722.55.101.0.201.1, I kid you not specifies that if you want an external socket installed for long-term slow car charging then one stamped with EV on its rear must be sourced as this is designed for a long-term high load. Personally I haven't seen any such sockets on the market but then again I haven't been looking for them. There's not much to say about the appendices other than a quick look at the model forms in Appendix 6. The model forms show what information the certificates or report paperwork should contain along with a suggested formatting. You don't have to follow the layout as presented and can come up with your own design or use third-party paper forms or software. Form filling is a pain in the arse. I didn't become an electrician to spunk out paperwork, so I prefer it to be as brief as possible. Personally, I believe the form should contain the basic test data and a statement of compliance. That should then be signed. There's no need for endless checklists to drag down my day, yet any new addition or amendment always adds to the paperwork burden. Thankfully, not a lot has changed this time. For the most part, the Electrical Installation Certificate and the Electrical Installation Condition Report seem about the same. However, the Minor Work Certificate contains some extras, including ZE, DB Reference Number, Circuit Number, Bonding Connections and Ring Continuity. The 5 times RCD test introduced in Amendment 3 for the Minor Works seems to have been dropped again from the Model Form in 18th edition. If we compare the 2011 minor works to the 18th edition, you can see that the complexity of this form has been much increased. So yeah, cheers. The scheduler test results now includes fields to show what insulation resistance voltage has been applied to a circuit under test and whether the test button of an AFDD confirms mechanical operation, but that's about it. Finally, a couple of other items of note. You may have heard rumours around earth spikes being required for TNCS installations which would be ridiculous and unworkable and thankfully it was dropped. There is no new requirement for earth rods in the 18th. It was such a ridiculous suggestion in the first place that I do honestly wonder if it was mooted as a red herring just to detract from the other changes and give us all something to shout about. Almost like a saying, we're keeping all the other proposed changes but we'll drop that one because we've listened to your feedback. Well, such a fucking stupid idea should never have been put forward in the first place, so no shit you've listened to the feedback. Uh, originally there was also going to be a new part, part 8, energy efficiency, but this has instead been rolled into a new informative appendix, so 18th edition still has 7 parts, but 17 appendices now, with only appendix 1 being normative, the remainder being informative. You can expect to see appendix 17 become part 8 when IET and BSI feel like sending us all new books, so probably sooner rather than later. Appendix 17 wibbles on about energy efficiency uh, and lighting controls and voltage drop versus cable size, but seems to say little of actual interest. And so there we have it, the changes to the 18th edition wiring regulations, or at least the ones that are primarily important to me. Oh yeah, but enough of my waffle, go away and enjoy the sunshine. Have, have they gone? Good.